It's my pleasure to welcome all over you to very wonderful session number eight, which title is Hybridity and Identity Development of Second Generation Diaspora. And it is my pleasure to introduce about speaker, the Reverend Kamal Virakun. Actually, Reverend Kamal Virakun was born in Sri Lanka and growth in Australia. He is a minister of the Presbyterian Church of Australia, an associate staff of workers, Australian Fellowship of Evangelical Student, and a PhD candidate, Maureen Theological College, Australian College of Theology. Am I right? And uh, are you ready to welcome him, please? Okay, then please welcome him with a big hands. Thank you, Doctor. Thank you, everyone, for having me. It's a pleasure and a privilege for me to be addressing you. I am multiply hybrid because I am also denominationally hybrid. In Sri Lanka, I grew up in the Methodist Church while attending an Anglican Church school. In, when I first moved to Australia, I attended Sydney Anglican Churches. Uh, I am an ordained Presbyterian minister and doing my PhD at the Baptist College. So there you go. <laughs> Many years ago, I visited, I was invited uh, to speak to the youth group of a, in a Sri Lankan background, Tamil language church. So I went along, and there were a bunch of sullen young people sitting there. I, sp I cheerfully spoke to them from the book of Colossians, and they nodded politely. And I just felt like this vibe is weird. I asked them, what's wrong? I was young enough at the time, this was a while back, I was young enough to engage with them as peers. I was still just their older brother. And so they opened up and basically told me how unhappy they were, how bored they were with church and being lectured from the Bible and having to perform this Christian stuff that their parents were shoving on them. And it was really, really tragic. Now this was before, well before, I think I was still at university, so this is well before I engaged in any academic study of hybridity, uh, biculturality, and the challenges of ethnic churches. But I want to address, to address that issue now. And so this, this presentation, I've been given a second generation diaspora, I am going to approach this as the challenge of evangelizing and discipling the children of Christian immigrants, especially in the context of ethnic churches. I hope that that's acceptable. Well, too late. That's what you're going to get anyway. <laughs> I hope that that's what's been in your mind from the title. And of course, coming from a Western context in Australia, I shall address it from the perspective of dealing with the challenges of secularism, sexuality, etc., as we find from the West. In the discussion afterwards, I would love to hear from anyone who is, has experience of uh, second generation non-Western. So what's it like to try and bring up Christians of, say, Indians or Sri Lankans in Kenya or something like that? Okay. Bicultural, hybridized Christians. We live at the border. One of the, uh, some of the language that we have already heard in our papers is that of being boundary riders, liminality, living in the interstices, the little cracks that let in the light of existence. And so the children of Christian immigrants live in a multiple, they're hybridized because we live in multiple li uh, lives and of multiple backgrounds. Children of our parents living in, say, Australia or a Western context or seeking to bridge that, uh, that gap, but perhaps also being influenced by other churches, so going along to our parents' church, our parents' church, which may be an ethnic church or maybe a local church, so we are experiencing that hybridity there. Or if we are going to an ethnic church, but observing and going along to youth groups or fellowships or even school meetings where we are uh, exposed to people from other church backgrounds, there's a multiple hybridity there. And all of that implicated with how do we live as Christians in an increasingly anti-Christian, if not uh, you know, de-Christianized, hi highly secularizing, society. These are the challenges, the frontiers that our children are faced with. 
And, the, and what I'm going to do is I'm not going to read my paper. It's there in the book for you. I shall present a, a summary and some additional uh, thoughts, which I have, uh, as I've continued to do research, I am developing this paper. It is an aspect of my PhD. And so how are our children, how are we going to shape Christian identity for frontier living? My thesis is basically this. We need a gospel-centered, but not gospel-reductive, rightly contextualized, contextualized theology. A theology, by theology I mean an integrated understanding of God, ourselves, and God's world. Where that theology, by its nature as a divine self-shaping, identity-shaping, and world-shaping news, hence thoroughly evangelical, though not gospel-reductive, where the gospel is woven through that theology, even as that theology addresses uh, other aspects beyond just how, what it means to be saved. That theology, by its nature as a dis divine, identity-shaping, world-changing news, that theology propels us to participate in that news by joining God in his mission, held hence Michio Dei. That is my thesis. That is what we need. And I, what I want to show you is some challenges to that, but also propose a way of mutually respecting the traditions of the elders while inviting the children to navigate their new situation. Mutual respect and intergenerational ministry. First, let me propose that we see the traditions of the elders, the ethnic church that we inherit, as appropriately contextualized. Look, those first generation traditions they didn't fall from heaven, but they grew up on earth as a response to revelation, a response to what, what we believe God says in the word. Contextualized theologies, especially with India and Sri Lanka, we are dealing with nearly 2,000 years of tradition. And that's a, there's a, a dignity and a, a, a nobility to that which goes back to uh, the independent existence of the church planted by St. Thomas himself, or perhaps his disciples, even if he personally, according to the mythology of the St. Thomas Christians, even if he personally didn't get there, somebody did, because the St. Thomas churches exist. And so there is an independent existence of subcontinental Christianity, and that has dignity, and that represents an attempt to live faithfully in the subcontinent. And that's why it endured, because it has this faithfulness within it. Now, in a moment, I'm going to say that in a thoroughly Protestant way, tradition is not inviolate. Everything needs to be reformed according to the word of God. But the point is to respect that tradition, because we can at least prima facie, at least at first glance, say that is an attempt to shape godly Christian identity back home. But, as I've already said, well, look, to what extent are these traditions shaping godly Christian identity? As a Protestant and an evangelical, the scriptures, the word of God, represent the inviolate tradition, the one, uh, the, 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 the one norm by which all other norms are normed. And only scripture comes with divine authority to command the conscience. Anything and everything else may be a good human tradition to be respected, but is not inviolate. So to what extent, as the, we can invite the children or even the parents, as uh, like Sam George said, as we experience these destabilizing effects of hybridity, one, of, one good way, uh, Paul's, Paul Snyder, your question about how can hybridity be redemptive, one good way that hybridity might be redemptive is by challenging us to return to scripture and to reform our identity and to review our traditions. Not that they're necessarily wrong, but the, uh, the Ten Commandments say, honor your father and mother, not replicate. Don't try to be your father and mother because you're not your father or mother. mother. We are our parents' heirs, as Yak Derrida says in, in the paper, which, which is published in your booklets, and you can look up the reference there. And also, we're not home anymore. We're not in Kansas anymore, Toto. Good grief. Sorry, okay, that's a Western reference. Only one person got that. My apologies. It's a movie, okay, all right, okay. That's, that's the hybridity working in me, all right? That was a, a Western movie reference. 
But we're not home anymore. I am going to report to you some of the results of one interview that I made, and the, the girl, the young woman now, she said, good grief, yes, I'm happy to be part of a Malayali church, but we're not in Kerala, this is Sydney. And there's the challenge for us, both the first and the second generation, to review, reform our traditions while not disrespecting them. We can respect them without replicating them. So there is my first proper proposition, my first proposal, that we respect the traditions of the elders without seeking to replicate them, nor, nor simply dismiss them as, well, that's so last millennium. And from the perspective, the challenge perhaps to the parents, but also to the children, is that our children are personal agents. Now, by personal agents, I don't mean James Bond 007. What I mean is that we respect the, the uh, ability of our children to, reflective, to, to, to reflect on scripture and reflect on theology and on our teaching and to construct in an intelligent and creative way a rightful response to their new situation. I don't like using the word independent. I don't like using the word individual because at least in a Western context, it smuggles in too many ideas of autonomy and self-satisfaction. I'm independent of my parents means parents get lost, I'm doing things my way. That's not what I mean. I'm, that's why I'm using the word agency. If somebody can think of a better term, please tell me and I'll happily use it. We are not independent in that way. We depend on God, we depend on our parents, we depend on the traditions, we depend on lots of things. But as individuals in the sense of people who are responsible to respond to the call of God in our lives, we can and need to, even our children, need to build what it means to respond to God in our particular situation. And so let us do what the author of Proverbs, what Solomon, uh, it did. Listen, my son, here is godliness. But notice, even by addressing the son, he is treating the son as a responsible agent who can hear and obey. And in Ephesians chapter 6, the apostle Paul treats children with respect. Children, obey your parents. This is right. And then he quotes um, the Ten Commandments. But as I've already intimated, as we do this, we challenge our children to live for Christ not just self-assertion, self-advancement, self-everything in a self-obsessed Western context. It's all about I, myself, and me. My point here is for parents to recognize that what I mean by personal agency, you know, individual responsibility, independence rightly understood of our personal integrity, this is not automatically sinful. The reason I say that is from the interviews and just my own personal experience, I can totally see the older parents really intensely teaching children in a traditional manner because they're so frightened that the children will go off the rails and do something immoral. The way that the interviewee whom I'll report in a, in later in the paper, uh, later in the presentation. The way she was talking, I could totally see her mom saying, Ayyo, if I let her do her own thing, next thing she'll be bringing her girlfriend, no. And then saying she's a boy. <laughs> like, as in, this, uh, this fear that if we give children a degree of independence and responsibility to work things out for themselves, a degree of autonomy rightly understood of you know, responsibility. Next thing, they'll just be completely immoral and, uh, and crazy and like, you know, in the worst caricature of hypersexualized secularism. Anyway, so then how can we help our children, given that, as Sam George and others have already said, they have so many sources. Part of hybridity is the pluralization of heritage. That's where our current globalized context, as Calvin uh, mentioned last night, uh, ye yesterday afternoon in his paper, in a globalized context, we have so many potentially contradicting sources from which to build our self-identity. We have the original home, the ethnic homes, India or Sri Lanka or Philippines or wherever, and the new home. So in my research, it's, uh, it's Indians and Sri Lankans who have come to Australia. The Australian church, is a traditioned 
response to the gospel as well. What does it mean for Australians to respond to Jesus and seek to live faithfully for him? The various denominations, etc., are a response to that. But the Indians and Sri Lankans who do not have that long-term Australian heritage with the convicts and all, okay? It's simply replicating the Australian way of doing church isn't right either because we're hybrids. We're neither here nor there. And then never underestimate the significance of other diasporans. One of my other research subjects whom I don't have time to report on, he says he feels comfort, most comfortable with his Sri Lankan background, born, uh, he was two years old when he came to Australia. He feels most comfortable with people who are Korean background, Chinese background, Indian background, and Sri Lankan background. Uh, he, has a, he bears a pan-Asian identity. And he very, he hastened to say in his interview, oh, it's not that I hate Aussies. No, 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 I love Aussies. But I just feel comfortable with these Asians. So there is something in that Asian pan diasporan identity, and perhaps we could explore that more in discussion, where we can help each other and learn what it means to live for Christ as people of that pluralized identity. But where is our final authority and how do we go about this work of this, this task of working out what it means to live faithfully for Christ as people of this plural heritage, there's no shortcut, folks. Ad fontes, as the, great, uh, the early reformers, the great Protestants said, back to the sources. Let us reform according to the word of God. Let me briefly give you my own theology of how scripture gives us a transcultural, and precisely because it is transcultural, it is therefore intercultural harmonizing our different backgrounds in a way that is peaceful and glorious and wonderful. The, the joy of, of hearing the many tribes and nations singing the praises of the Lamb in Revelation chapter 7. Can we have a proliptic view of that even today? Yes, we can, it, precisely because Scripture gives us that integration. Gospel-centered but not gospel-reductive theology. The scriptures are a narrative. We have heard our presenters already speaking about the significance of story and how we can, and it is now taken for granted in identity theory, secular identity theory, that we construct our identity as we build our personal narrative, drawing on other narratives around us. Scripture is a narrative, starting with creation. And the creation of all people, that is a universal sense of I am here and somebody brought me here. Okay? Uh, and the sense that things are not right, the fall and sin, whether we use the traditional language of sin, etc., is not the point, as our very first presenter uh, spoke to us. But let us engage in this, in, in this sense and this thoroughly biblical idea that things are deeply wrong that right down from our head to our toes, as the Apostle Paul says in Romans chapter 3, okay, their eyes and their mouth is full of vipers and their feet are quick to, uh, the way of peace they do not know. So from uh, our whole self is corrupted. Let us engage in that from a scriptural perspective to critique cultural sins, and the, the sins of both the cultures, all the cultures, and the story of redemption, which goes from Israel, redeemed in the Exodus and so on, Therefore, God can and does work through a particular cultural location to redeem the world. And that he, is, he, of course, redeems us in Christ. Christ, who is son of David, not Johnson from London, not Siliba Alasuria from Sri Lanka. Okay? We worship a, a crucified and resurrected Jew. I do not worship a Sri Lankan. Nevertheless, God the Son, the second person of the Trinity, became the second Adam who represents humanity before the face of God as the son of David, the, the Jew. To me, that means that God can and does take, capture up our enculturated identity and locatedness in his redemptive, redemptive purposes. I personally am very happily hyphenated as a Sri Lankan Australian. One, the, 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 uh, one of my interviewees, um, the guy who has the pan-Asian identity, he also, I think, would say he's happily hyphenated because he's so grateful to Australia for the hospitality, but he's proud to be Sri Lankan. 
Whereas the other interviewee, she very interestingly, like the drawing on the Japanese, the, the paper on Japan that Gary gave us, that very last um, line on the table, what Japanese identity, or uh, I'm Brazilian of Japanese background, she would say, oh, she's Australian, Mike, but of Indian background. Yeah? But all of that, Christ, because he, he, God can and does capture up our ethnic and uh, locatedness in his redemptive purposes in the church on a mission as we go towards the fulfillment of all things. We are all li living for something. To live for nothing is, is, is miserable. It is depression. It is, it's something that needs to be addressed through counseling. What are we living for? Who are we living for? Where are we going? What are we expecting? Here are some, I'm sure you are very familiar with these, through a, a biblical theology, an unfolding of God's purposes in and through the Holy Scriptures centered in Christ. As we re-engage this with our children, doing so quite, I, I would say, proudly, saying, here is our tradition, what we grew up with, but respecting them, saying, look, we are not at home, back home anymore. This is a new home. Let us teach you, but you, you think about it yourself and rework our traditions as our heirs. And as we, our, our prayer and desire for you is that you would live for Jesus, not just for us. You are children of God, not just children, our children. And with that in line, uh, let, let me give you this example, which I've sort of tantalized you with so, so much already. This Indian background, Australian Christian woman, she, uh, she was faced with very rigid gender stereotypes at home. She was told, this is your level, this is your role, this is what you need to do. That's some quotes from my interview with her. Okay? At home, she says, I could only do certain things. I'd only be able to leave the house or come back from the house at a certain time, whereas my brother was allowed to do whatever he wanted. Unfortunately, that classic like, uh, inconsistency of so, uh, really protecting the, the dignity the, the, uh, of the girl and protecting her reputation, which in principle, I don't think is wrong. Okay? There's, a, there's one of those interesting hybrid, mutual respect, intergenerational dialogues that needs to happen. What do you, because I'm sure mom would have said, if somebody went along and said, why can't she be given the same freedoms that the son, mom would say, what, you want my daughter to be known as a prostitute? Her desire is to protect the honor, the reputation of her daughter in ways that are not wrong. But there is some blindness here as to how that is interpreted in the new context. So that dialogue, that, uh, that, that understanding needs to happen. And it really it affected her identification of home. I identify being Australian because Australia, she says, is more welcoming and warmer, whereas India is colder, far away and foreign. Look, in Sydney, we need to wear jumpers. India is warmer. <laughs> but you see what she means. She sees India as foreign because, she was, because of the way she was brought up. And unfortunately, in Sunday school, church, because of the, the f style of teaching that she was ex uh, exposed to in Sunday school, church was a alien. She had to go to Sunday school forcibly. And when she was at church, oh, I don't know what I'm doing here. The language is different because it was an uh, Indian language church. So we're reading the same book, just re regurgitating the same things all the time. She had a transliterated book which she mumbled through. And, you know, I didn't enjoy it. I didn't enjoy, I like it. And it, they used in Sunday school a very didactic teaching style where they had to memorize verses and things and memorize stuff from church history. And those books were imported from India. Now look at the uh, precision of her analysis here. Hey, look, that stuff is great for the Indian kids that are growing up there, but not relevant to Aussie kids here. And what she means by Aussie kids is the children, the second generation, not white Anglo-Saxons. So notice even despite her like ne negative experience of church, she is trying to be courteous to home, or at least her former background. But, so I, I asked her in the middle of the interview, so why are you still Christian? I mean, it sounds to me what, that you are the 
classic case of secular atheism good, religion oppressive bad. Why, why am I here? Why are you not one of the statistics? By the grace of God, the Bible and the Holy Spirit subverted all of the problems and built in her a love for Christ, the Christ of Scripture, reading things in the Bible, she said, like, look, Jesus says, don't grieve the children and let them come to me. And she felt, therefore, affection and loyalty to this Jesus. Mary Magdalene, or the female at the well, Jesus having conversations that I could relate to or understand, and outspoken female characters that the Bible highlights and celebrates. Therefore, she was able to, from an early age, distinguish between Christ and culture, where she said, look, all those ne negative experiences, that wasn't Christ or the Bible, it was just mom. <laughs> and she said, she, no, she didn't have any anger towards Christianity as such, just the particular ethnic sort of tradition of the church. Then a key point for her was youth ministry, which engaged with issues of immediate relevance. So she said they brought up things that were prevalent at the time, like homosexuality and sex before marriage, depression, mental health. All these things, she said, that would never be taken up in Sunday school. These, these are what's happening in society right now, but they're things that we would never talk about at Sunday school or church. So that was really exciting, getting into it, she says. Also, her youth ministry engaged a dialogical style of teaching where there would be a presentation and that presentation would be unashamedly biblical and Christian, but after that there would be discussion groups where the discussion was free-flowing. What did you think? You know, what? And in fact, certain people were catalysts. You see, the mini Lausan movement, Yahoo. C catalysts where they were prompt, supposed to prompt further discussion and not allow the young people to just say, well, you know, blah, 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 because that's what the predictable response is. That's fantastic. And so through this, through the youth ministry, she, was, she, she shaped very deep convictions that I was loving. I tell you, these interviews were great. Uh, I am so enjoying doing them. They're feeding my soul and feeding my faith. She came to a strong understanding of the Bible as God's authoritative and therefore identity-shaping word. In terms of authority, she says, the Bible is the word of God, coming straight from his mouth. I take it as it is. But it is not just some law book that she has to obey. It's deeply personal. She feels able to have a conversation, and I think she means in prayer as she reads the scriptures, a degree of spirituality there. Have that conversation with Jesus. Is this what you want from me? And that leads to a faithful discipleship, that the confidence that she has this faith of God, faith in God, that he has written these words for a reason. And so even when she um, reads things that she doesn't like and that sort of sounds more like the traditional church practices that she rejected or is uncomfortable with, even then it's easier, she says, holistically, this is what the verse means, and she has a rightful understanding, I think, of tolerance, of diverse interpretation, a very sophisticated uh, hermeneutic. Uh, look, if I saw a female friend of mine getting up and doing a sermon, I wouldn't be like, sit down. I don't think she's sinning because at the end of the day, she is glorifying God. To give you context for this, she has come under the influence of uh, Christian teachers who hold to what's called complementarianism. That is where women should not preach sermons. Complementarianism is not against women leadership, it, but it, it says women should, uh, un, women should not lead mixed Bible studies and should not preach to mixed congregations. And at the moment, now she's working it through, but provisionally she agrees with the complementarian position, but she said this, she is not going to contradict the conscience of a woman who thinks differently to her. That is a very sophisticated hermeneutic paying rightful attention, and a couple of times she said it's there in black and white, that words on the page matter. She's not going to dismiss them, but she interprets them in a pious way. I want to obey Jesus, not just beat people with the Bible, and she is going to uh, be courteous towards people whose interpretation disagrees. Therefore, she engaged in a bi biblical critique of Indian culture in a context where she was talking about men who react with 
um, anger and defensiveness when their women, when their wives have a, a, a career that is better than theirs. She said, look, the Bible would go, no, you're not respecting your wife if you're like oppressing her or demeaning her because she's earning more than you. You are sinning. But uh, she was also able to engage in a biblical critique of Australian culture. Women focusing on the outward rather than the inward. I think by that she means the sort of the sexualization and the raunch culture. Tithing, homosexuality, uh, transgender, pornography, sexualization. She brought all of this up. And then she said, you read it in the Old Testament. It happened then. It's happening now in the Australian community. So she is able to engage with scripture and recognize, oh my goodness, the Bible talks about all of these dangers. And, and she is very morally conservative. The best way to avoid her bringing her girlfriend home and then saying she's a boy was to expose her to the scriptures, not to just hammer her with traditional um, ethics. And I am glad to say she has a vigorously Christian missional self-identity. For me, she says, being a Christian is every element of life. Whether it's waking up in the morning, going to work, that's all part of my Christian faith. Understanding the word, going to church and everything like, like, like that, but also spreading the word to those who need to hear it. And she talked with me about how she is very uh, outspoken about her Christian identity at work and seeks to just chat with people about it as she is able to. And she's a, you know, she's a professional of a, a well-respected job in a, in a very big uh, firm in Australia. So let me conclude. What does it mean? How can we engage the second generation and build in them or rather encourage them to uh, explore and to construct a deep identity of themselves as Christians, followers of Christ, in their particular situation as people of pluralized background. We need this intergenerational, intercultural engagement where we unashamedly use tradition as a resource, honor your father and mother, but explicitly engage with today's issues without fear or ignorance or naivety. Oh, don't worry, you're Indian. You won't be able to, you won't need to um, deal with that. Uh, which, but we, and in this engagement, we, uh, faithful to the scriptural Christ by demonstrating how following him is good. Is this not what we seek to do with discipleship generally? Yes and amen. I think the, the, the particularity of hybridity and the second generation is the challenges of the liquid nature of globalized hybrid identity. That, the instability, so that we cannot simply hand on the tradition and, the, and all we do, the next generation maybe tinkers a little bit at the edge for, to update things. We can't, it's not that simple anymore. We need to, but we can. I think it's actually an opportunity, not a problem. We can go down deep, back to the sources of Scripture, back to the sources of what it means to live for Christ. Why is living for Him good? But if this young woman is any example, if we do that, we can trust the Holy Spirit and the Word of God to build up our children, to be someone whom we thank God for and are proud, proud of and release as missionaries into the world and then take cover and let's see what they get up to. Thank you and amen.